So let me give you some other examples of laws of, of, uh, of nature. Well, we could argue about this, and philosophers do, whether Newtonian mechanics is really a law of nature, uh, but it's certainly a way of making predictions about experiments, so I'll include it in the list. And this is the law of nature that tells you how objects move in very general circumstances. It tells you that uh, the change of momentum, essentially the mass times the acceleration, is proportional to the force. Um, there's Newton's law of gravitation that tells you how two objects attract each other just by virtue of having uh, mass. The, there are the laws of electricity and magnetism that tell you how electrons move if they, if they go through magnetic field or how magnets move if they uh, are acted upon by, by electrical currents and the like. The special relativity, which kind of supersedes Newtonian mechanics if objects move extremely rapidly, so near to the speed of light. There's general relativity, which uh, is all about what happens if you move very fast and you've got quite a big mass. So if you're interested in stars and behavior around stars or even bigger objects, even heavier objects. And then there's quantum mechanics, which Chris Powell's mentioned in the last uh, in the question and answer session, which tells you about properties of motion at the very smallest scales, motion of electrons inside individual atoms and the like, or the motion of electrons through conducted wires to give rise to uh, electrical conduction. So these are all laws of nature, and they all are pretty much like Galileo's. They all seem to be true everywhere in the universe, as far as we know, um, and they seem to be enormously accurate. So now we get to the heart of it. What's the role of mathematics? in this interplay. How does mathematics appear in this in the study of physics? Well, there are several ways. First of all, the laws of nature are most naturally expressed in terms of mathematics. Mathematics is the natural language for these laws, and I'll show you some examples in a little while of equations that underpin the laws of nature that I've already uh, written out for you. So mathematics then plays two very, very important roles. The first role is you need mathematics to work out the consequences of the laws. If you want to describe an experiment, you've got to solve an equation. It might be Newton's equation to solve for the flight of some missile or some projectile it's thrown. Uh, you've got to solve an equation. That's the sort of thing you do in A-level. Uh, it might be the sort of equation you solve if you want to understand uh, roller coaster rides or the flow of fluids. So there are equations to solve, and that's a great job for mathematics. But Wigner's point was a slightly different one. It's that actually, and rather remarkably, Mathematics often plays a pivotal role in the discovery of these laws. And very surprisingly, and this is the really remarkable thing, it's these advanced concepts, these things that when they were invented seem to have nothing to do with the real world, that actually play a crucial role. And that the laws of nature, when you write them in terms of mathematics, involve these remarkable constructions of the human mind, like complex numbers, matrices, and other generalized symmetries, other objects like that. So his point was, mathematicians play these games. They come up with these amazing little games that kind of seem fun, and they invent the rules for them. These have come from the human mind. Um, but then, lo and behold, 10, 20, 50 years later, physicist comes along and finds these are exactly the tools needed to describe the real world. So this is Wigner's point, and his point is, that it's absolutely uncanny how often this happens. So what's the relationship between mathematics inventing games and physicists discovering the laws of nature? Well, let me give you some examples um, of this, but let me finish just this slide with a quotation. It's difficult to avoid the impression that a miracle confronts us here. This is Wigner's thesis. Now, you might agree or disagree with that. If you believe in miracles, I don't know. But this is Wigner's quotation, and this is his key point. So let me give you some examples. First example is one that you've all met, I'm sure, and this is Newtonian mechanics. So there's Newton, and there he is again, and there's his famous equation. And I, I agree, we could dispute, we could argue whether this really represents uh, advanced mathematics or not. Certainly it took people millennia to come up with the calculus, um, but Newton and Leibniz did. Uh, and it was very current mathematics, and it was exactly what was needed to describe the motion of objects. So this kind of simple equation underpins the motion of all projectiles, underpins the motion of the planets if they're not going too quickly or near too massive an object. It underpins the flow of fluids. It underpins the roller coaster rides we saw earlier. So it's this kind of universal equation. And to come up with it, Newton did have to invent the calculus. 
So that seems kind of like a, re a relationship between fundamental mathematics and physics. Um, but it's maybe not the best example, and better examples will come. Now I'm going to show you a second example, and this is the laws of um, electromagnetism. And these were written down by a very great uh, physicist, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, um, about 100 and, uh, 140, 150 years ago. Um, and I'm going to show you the equation for, uh, Ma that Maxwell wrote down to describe all of electricity and all of magnetism. Every single question you can ask about electricity and magnetism is embodied in these equations. And I'm going to do this very bravely because I'm not even going to tell you what the terms in the equations mean. So it looked kind of frightening, it looked like gobbledygook, but the amazing thing is you can write down these equations on just one slide. And here they are. I've written them in a funny form. There's a kind of matrix, and those are the equations. And that's it. You don't have to understand what the symbols are, just marvel at the fact that you can write these equations down in just two lines. This is the power of mathematics. Just these two equations underpin every single phenomenon in electricity and magnetism. And the point is that to write these equations down, you actually have to know about vectors and geometry. And before that kind of machinery was invented, people did understand a little bit about electricity and magnetism, but not nearly as to the extent that Clark Maxwell discovered when he combined vector geometry and matrices uh, with the calculus to come up with his equations. And in fact, it's a remarkable story that when he pieced together all the experimental information about electricity and magnetism, he found, and, and tried to put them in the form of nice equations, he found they didn't look so beautiful. And so he guessed a little bit of one equation to make the equations look really beautiful, and lo and behold, that then turned out to be crucial in describing lots of experiments in the real world. So Maxwell used mathematics to guess what the right laws of nature were. Now, these equations might look horrible, but mathematicians now have great ways of writing them. And here are Maxwell's equations in the way modern uh, mathematicians would write them. And what could be more beautiful than that? These two equations tell you everything about the light in the room, the way that electrical currents move through the nerves in our body. It's all there in those two equations. Right, next example, geometry and relativity. Well, this was really developed by Einstein. Uh, and there's the great man, and there he is again. Um, and there's the equation of general relativity. And Einstein struggled to develop the theory of relativity, and he was, had the key physical ideas, but he couldn't really write the equations down until he discovered, until one of his friends told him, that what he needed was non-Euclidean geometry. He'd never heard of this subject. It was a subject invented by mathematicians 50, 60 years earlier. But lo and behold, it was exactly what Einstein needed to frame the theory of relativity. And when you use non-Euclidean geometry in the mathematics of that, what could be simpler than this equation? And yet in that one equation is all the information about black holes, the how quasars work, um, the, the, the large-scale geometry and topology of the, of the universe. It's all there in that simple equation. It's all there in non-Euclidean geometry.